A Fragile Geography. There is a tender balance here. Animal populations are dwindling due to loss of habitats and shrinking ranges. The biggest problem is the conflict between humans and wildlife. Add poaching to the equation and the future of natural assets look bleak. Creatures are in need of help. There are dozens of organizations in Namibia who are working relentlessly to provide assistance. They are doing everything to revive the natural history of our planet to conditions that existed before human intervention. Circumstances are challenging, but dedication and training are their main instruments. Get ready, I'll keep you updated if I find anything else. Lions, my guests want to see lions and elephants. Uh, Rudy, elephants is this is the story of rare and endangered species and the heroes of nature conservation striving to prevent their extinction. We want to keep them alive and everything, but sometimes I also feel, are we doing the right thing? Or should we just let them go? If I had given honey bun to anyone else, there was a good chance she was going to die. So I had to keep going. You just, you just can't stop, you can't quit. Garoub. The land of wild horses struggling for their lives in the desert. One of the most dramatic nature conservation issues of Namibia is also the most controversial. How wild are wild horses? Why are they here? Do they really need to be protected? Christine is one of the nature conservationists dedicated to keeping horses alive in Garub. Um, I mean, they're here now almost, yeah, no, they're actually here already 100 years. Um, there are a lot of theories around the horses, a lot of myths being told over time, um, but actually basically it runs down to that um, at the end of the First World War, the South African troops were stationed here. If you look to your left. There are different opinions as to why the wild horses of Garub are here. The South African cavalry was positioned on these plains during World War I. The troops suffered extensive losses during an air raid by German forces. From the 6,000 horses, those that survived the attack escaped and scattered to different parts of the region. Back then, this place was both a military zone and a diamond mining field, so the horses roamed these empty lands freely for years on end. Horses. So a lot of horses disappeared or were just scattered. And then with the end of the First World War, um, actually quite a few horses remained here. And then there was also a big horse stud by the mayor of Lüderitz, just east of ours. Uh, he bred race horses and horses for the mining and Lüderitz for the diamond mines and so. And yeah, he actually went bankrupt then also with the whole chaos of the First World War. Also some horses remained there. Horses that adapted to desert conditions and survived were able to access limited food and water on the hills. Farmers coined them ghosts of the Namib. However, 
According to a law that passed in the 1960s, all farm owners had to fence off their property, leaving the horses without access to food and water. Most of them had to return to this region where water is absent and food is very limited. The droughts which reoccur every three to four years turn challenging conditions from bad to worse. When horses started to die in their masses, a director from the diamond mining industry had a water source constructed. The only water source in the region is still a lifeline for the horses and wildlife. Because we know that horses have to drink very regularly, but these horses are really pushing it, especially in winter. They can go without water for 72 hours, which is quite amazing for horses. Especially because if you, if you want to study their behavior and adaptation and the social interaction. It is something that you don't see every day in domestic horses anymore because here they can still be free even if life is very harsh and especially now with the drought it's sometimes heartbreaking. We lost the other day we lost a horse that just couldn't get up anymore. When I came in the morning he was dead. Founded in 2012, the Namibia Wild Horses Foundation provides food for the horses during periods of drought. The foundation, which relies on donations, tries to raise awareness about the horses and their historic, touristic, and natural values. For us as a foundation, um, feeding the horses, it's, it helps that people really are emotional about horses. On the other hand, I sometimes feel that if you would see an oryx with a broken leg, would you really do something about it? If you see a horse with a broken leg, then people tend to want to do something about it. And with the wild horses, I mean, they are, actually they are feral, but they have been declared actually as their own breed a couple of years ago, so you could say they are wild horses by now. Um, yeah, if you see them here coming up to the car, our little meals on wheels here, they. Do they really feel wild to you anymore? It's, for us, it's, it's not easy with the whole feeding. We, we want to keep them alive and everything, but sometimes I also feel, are we doing the right thing? Or should we just let them go? there are only seven to 8,000 cheetahs left on the planet, and 2,000 of them are in Namibia. Namibia has a lot of responsibility to protect these animals. Crowded cheetah populations mean a lot of cheetah problems. Settlements effusing into natural habitats with farmland in close proximity to wild animals have led cheetahs to seek farm animals which are easy prey. Having lost animals to the cheetahs, farmers retaliate by tracking down and wiping out animals from their territory. After identifying the problem, the CCF focused on avoiding them from the beginning. The most effective method is preventing cheetahs from killing farm animals. So CCF's Livestock Guardian Dog Program began in 1994. Um, we use the Kangles and the Anatolian Shepherds, and we breed them and provide them to Namibian farmers to protect their livestock against predator attacks. Um, what happens a lot is predators, they run out of room and it starts colliding with the human population. Um, and they start going after easy targets like uh, small stocks such as goats or sheep. Um, so we use these dogs to help protect the livestock and in return, the farmers allow the predators to live freely and safely on their land. There are many reasons why Kangal dogs have been chosen for the job. Now we chose these big guys here 
partially because they are a large breed. Um, they also, there's a similar uh, climate in Turkey. Um, they're used to this hot weather. Um, they also have a nice short coat, which is very good for this climate. They're very, very strong dogs and it's natural for them to basically bond to small stock or to something and then protect it. The Livestock Guarding Dog Project using Kangles has been a success. It is in the interest of farmers for the wild animals to live here. Kangles offer protection for their herds and farmers also benefit from increased ecotourism income with the preservation of natural assets. Farmers have seen about an 80 to 100 percent reduction in livestock losses. Um, and, and the farmers here, they understand the importance of the predators and their wildlife. So they, they want to work to keep that alive. They feel like that's part of their culture. So a lot of them don't actually want to get rid of the predators. They, wanna, they want them to live on their farm. They can use them for other purposes, such as ecotourism, um, and to keep their, their wildlife diverse there. CCF also implements comprehensive studies on the cheetahs. Besides observation and radio transmitter tracking, the foundation also performs genetic research. CCF's founder and director, Dr. Lori Marker, is the head of this important initiative executed by a dedicated team and with the assistance of supporters and volunteers. This is one of our orphan cheetahs, Solo, and she's um, about 16 years of age. So here at the Cheetah Conservation Fund, our work is really trying to keep cheetahs living in the wild. So not to have orphan cats, um, although if they are here and we get them as tiny cubs, we have to take care of them properly. We don't want cheetahs to catch people's livestock. We don't want any predator to catch livestock. And so what we do is to try to teach people about how the predators live. It is impossible for orphaned cubs and physically impaired cheetahs to return to the wild. These cheetahs are used for CCF's training, awareness raising, and research activities. Since its foundation, the CCF has treated hundreds of cheetahs and released them into the wild. The African wild dog, one of the rarest predators on the continent. This wild but equally fragile animal has been forced to live in conservation zones. They need large hunting grounds and habitat loss is a major concern. Irindi Game Reserve might have a reputation for its wild dogs, but over the years, it has also been the center of numerous important projects. During their work at Irindi, the Global Leopard Project has obtained significant information about leopards, one of the most majestic of the big cats. The project's already been running for 10 years at Irindi, and it's been connected to 10 years of data that we gathered before we started here at Irindi Private Game Reserve. And we've started to form an incredible picture of really what's happening, and of course we want to be able to use this information for other people, for other leopards, for other research projects into the future. Studies here closely concern the future of the spotted cat in Africa and Asia. Natasha and her team are trying to find answers to pressing questions. For example, can leopards be reintroduced into a new area? Those subspecies that have disappeared from countries like Turkey and, and possibly from Zanzibar, they look like the cats are not there anymore. Is it possible to reintroduce these cats if there's habitat available, if people are willing for it? And by studying a natural population, we can get a really good idea of information like that. From dawn till late at night, Researchers at Arindi are tracking animals with radio transmitter collars. GP is the head of the rangers here. Besides attending to safari tourists, he contributes to field studies. 
It is especially important to track the movements of big cats like cheetahs, leopards, and lions. Close observation of their range and their prey provide important information about these rare creatures and their habitats. Years of data from various areas are combined to determine problems and find solutions. I believe that the main threat for leopards worldwide is a combination of, of aspects. The one is definitely habitat loss, obviously if you have no habitat. And although leopards are incredibly adaptable and leopards can live even in the cities, in places like Johannesburg cats are still being found, they're very, very adaptable, but they still need to have a healthy area to survive in, to be able to hunt in, to be, to be able to raise cubs in and so on. Natasha emphasizes the fragility of nature's balance. Humans have squandered their credit on mistakes. Balances can be upturned any moment. Located next to Arindi, rest has rehabilitated many different species, but it has a focus on two species in particular. I run this organization. I run the Rare and Endangered Species Trust in Namibia. And we really focus on on a lot of the animals that other people don't focus on. There's a frog and a snake and, and uh, the African wild dog. Um, but two of the animals that we work with really, really strongly at the moment because they're in serious crisis are vultures and pangolins. Pangolins are one of the most elusive creatures on the planet. They are in trouble. This strange looking, but quite cute animal is targeted by poachers for its armor-like body plates. Pangolins are just absolutely some of the most amazing animals in the world and we virtually know nothing about them. We didn't realize until really the last couple of years how endangered they are. The trade in Asia, there's four species in Asia, four in Africa, and the trade in Asia has just, it's skyrocketed in the last couple of years. We um, have discovered that in Asia, there's, there's a couple of reasons why, why it's skyrocketed. One, it's in a way replacing rhino horn. The scales are the same keratin, they're exactly the same as your fingernails. So they grow and they break 100% just like fingernails. REST is one of the few organizations that implement successful studies on pangolins. Field surveys have offered deep insight into this mysterious creature. Quando Carnivore is another project that focuses on preventing problems from the onset. Lions have hunted local cattle herds for many years. But a natural disaster was barely prevented after farmers started retaliating by hunting those lions. Unfortunately, the winner of the battle between human and wildlife comes as no surprise. Hans from Quando Carnivore Project argues that lions sleep during the day and do not attack herds accompanied by shepherds. The problem starts when night falls. Unprotected animals spending the night by the village are easy prey for the lions. In fact, protecting farm animals from lion attacks is a much cheaper and a long-term solution. The special crawls, constructed with funding provided with the initiative of the Quando Carnivore Project, succeeded in keeping lions out. So now looking at this one, it seems to be like 99% safe comparing to our traditional ones. And even the number of lions, because that time they were hunting lions, whenever they see even tracks or seeing a lion, they look at it as a problem animal. With no losses, the conflict between farmers and wildlife ended. Not only are the herds protected, lion populations are also growing Halifax Island, off the coast of Luderitz. This is one of the 11 penguin breeding sites in Namibia. And this one 
is regarded as the third most important. There are about 25,000 pairs of African penguins on the planet. 6,000 of them breed in Namibia. Halifax Island is home to about 1,500 pairs. Up until the 1950s, there were 140,000 pairs here. There were 26,000 couples only a decade ago. Penguin populations are plummeting at an unprecedented rate. Fish. Fish is the overriding threat, both in South Africa and in Namibia. Um, they're supposed to be eating sardine, but that was fished out of southern Namibia in the late 60s, early 70s. And the only sardine you still have is in the north. And that's not where the breeding penguins can go. So they have to eat something else. It's a little fish called goby. And it's only got half the nutrition that your sardine would have. So it's a lot more difficult to catch as well. So the penguins are eating rubbish food. Having nests in the open are another threat for penguins. As a source of high quality fertilizer, guano was harvested from the island for many years. Penguins used to dig nests into guano to protect their eggs and hatchlings from the elements and predators. But after this layer was stripped by humans, these birds had to build their nests in the open. It might not be flawless, but Jessica has come up with an ingenious solution. This was in 2003, I think, 2004, I put them up. And over the years, they've become so full with nesting material, algae and rocks and limpets and that. And now they look in there and go, hmm, it's full. I don't like it. So somebody has to clean them out. And with a natural burrow, it would regenerate itself and collapse. The entrance would collapse and they would burrow further and further. But of course, with my bins, they can't do that. So it's worked, but it needs maintenance. So it's not ideal but it provides a roof over the heads and we've had better breeding success in the bins than we've had on the surface. So I guess it's worth it. There are steps that can be taken at the individual level. Not polluting the seas is one of them. However, unfortunately, the problem is massive, requiring government level intervention. I always tell people you want to help, don't pollute. Okay, that's a step in the right direction. Don't pollute, you know, keep the sea as clean as possible. But for these guys, really, the most essential thing is bring back the sardine. And that unfortunately has a lot to do with government policy um, and the market and overpopulation people need to eat, I suppose. But that's essentially the big thing is the sardine needs to come back. With very careful management, I guess it could but we would need to put a moratorium on sardine quotas for a good few years and let them recover. And that's not happening at the moment, unfortunately. Surviving tough conditions in this formidable geography is a challenge on its own. Add the human factor and circumstances become even more dire for creatures here. Our never ending greed and desire to expand and consume have brought species and habitats to the brink of extinction. Without natural assets, humans have little chance of survival. Nature conservationists, researchers, and scientists struggling in this unique geography are guarantors that these assets will be handed over to future generations. However, we all have to play a part in reducing the burden on a handful of heroes. Without nature, mankind is doomed. <laughs>